Since arriving in New York back in 1885, Lady Liberty has stood tall against the rapidly changing skyline of New York for 136 years, greeting countless immigrants, some of whom were our ancestors, taking their first steps in becoming American. And although we cherish the notion of this image, not many people realize just what an effort it was for this statue to come into existence, what occurred on Liberty Island prior to her existence, or that there was a time when one could stand out on the small balcony surrounding the torch, assumingly in admiration of a breathtaking view over New York. This is the story of the Statue of Liberty. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The statue has served as a beacon of America for over a century, and although many people adore it, I think it's important to dissect the artistic motifs and what they represent to better comprehend our impressions. First off, the work was modeled after the Roman goddess of freedom, yielding a torch to symbolize enlightenment. The seven spikes on her crown representing the universal nature of the concept of liberty across the seven seas and seven continents, with the broken shackle and chains beneath her right foot representing the forward march of America away from oppression and slavery. This statue so perfectly represents many of America's core values, and yet surprisingly, its very presence is also a testament to a long-lasting friendship formed between France and the United States during the American Revolution, bringing us to a tablet inscribed with Emma Lazarus's famous sonnet, The New Colossus, an appropriate greeting that was presented to the thousands of immigrants who passed through Ellis Island during its 60 years of service in order to seek a new life and opportunities. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest toast to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. These patriotic messages as conveyed by art still stir emotion and attract a staggering 3.5 million visitors from far and wide to its pedestal every year. It is a much beloved and well-known part of American culture, but did you ever wonder what was on this island before Lady Liberty? Stay tuned, because you will not believe the answer. You also would not believe how much trouble it was to find that information. In preparing this video, we had to dig deep, accessing thousands of websites, some of which came off as a bit sketchy, but I just discovered a tool which helps me to stay protected. So I wanted to share it with you guys, Atlas VPN. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount, meaning you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.39 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. But time is running out, so get your deal by clicking on the link in the video description below. And let me tell you, this service was a total game changer for me. As an American expat living in Europe, I enjoy the service's blazing speeds and ability to access streaming services around the world. As a video producer, my team downloads endless amounts of media from all corners of the internet, which would normally come with some malware risks. However, thanks to the fact that Atlas VPN stops ads and malware on unlimited devices, we have a total peace of mind. I should also note that Mrs. Socash saves cash while shopping online by getting the best deals regardless of her actual location. So protect yourself by signing up for this amazing offer before it expires. Once more, right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount, meaning you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.39 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Time is running out, so get your deal by clicking on the link in the video description below. And now, back to Our Lady Liberty. Liberty Island has had many different names and inhabitants in its time. According to the National Park Service, its history goes back as far as 994 AD, when the island was occupied by members of the Algonquin tribe, who used the island as a food source. Apparently, Liberty Island was incredibly rich with oyster beds, which Native Americans used as an important food source, eating the meat and discarding the shells. We also know that they ate smaller shellfish fin fish, as indicated by the shells and bones found during the 1985 restoration works on the island. 
Archaeologists found pottery shards and arrowhead fragments with the bones of animals ranging from duck to deer, which gives us a glimpse into their daily life and patterns that suggest an effective use of the seasons. Fishing in the spring, harvesting oysters, crabs, and clams in the summer, and hunting year-round in order to sustain a steady food source. This cycle was eventually disrupted by Europe's 16th century search for a passage to India as Henry Hudson founded a Dutch colony along the modern-day Hudson River after unsuccessfully attempting to find a passage to India through Northeast America. Initially, the Native Americans and Europeans formed a mutually beneficial trade relationship. Established in 1614, this exclusive trade agreement allowed the Dutch three years worth of rights to collect furs and pelts in return for various iron products such as pots, axes, and hoes. This relationship, however, ended up turning for the worse as the local New York tribes were pushed out of the area by a mixture of disease, war, and occupation as the island was further colonized. It was also around this time that the Dutch began referring to the island as Oyster Island, disconnecting it from association with Native Americans. By 1667, a Dutch colonist by the name of Isaac Bedloe obtained a colonial land grant for Oyster Island. Though his ownership was only approved by the sitting colonial governor Francis Lovelace in 1669 on the condition that he renamed it Love Island, as opposed to Bedloe's Island, as he originally planned to do. Even despite the fact that Bedloe died four years later in 1673, Love Island was still renamed Bedloe's Island after Governor Lovelace was overthrown by the Dutch Navy that same year. The island was taken over by the English a year later and passed hands several more times until it was established as a quarantine station by the city of New York. Ships that passed through would be held and inspected for disease and contamination before being allowed to move on. In 1746, Archibald Kennedy purchased the island to establish a summer residence on it, though it would only be re-established as a quarantine station due to the ongoing outbreak of smallpox from 1755 to 1757 and was ultimately reclaimed by New York City a year later in 1758. Then, during the American Revolution, Bedloe's Island was an asylum for the American colonists with loyalty to Great Britain, until returning to a quarantine station once again in 1784. In 1807, the U.S. Army declared Bedloe's Island as an official military post, and construction began on Fort Wood, completed in 1811. While Fort Wood's garrison was later disbanded, the United States Army remained active on the island until 1937. There was also a conflict about which state this island belonged to, only coming to terms in 1837 with a decree that the land itself belonged to New York and the submerged land surrounding the island belonged to New Jersey. And yet despite all this back and forth, 40 years later Bedloe's Island was chosen by Frederick Augusti Bartholdi as the official home for the Statue of Liberty, bringing us to the beginning of the island as the world would come to know it. Bartholdi was born in Kalmar, France in 1834. He completed his first commissioned work by the age of 20, a large statue of Napoleonic General Jean Rapp. Then he traveled with a group of French cultural ambassadors to photograph antiquities in Egypt. The desert landscapes inspired Bartholdi greatly, enough to write the following statement. These granite beings, in their imperturbable majesty, seem to be still listening to the most remote antiquity. Their kind and impassable glance seems to ignore the present and to be fixed upon the unlimited future. While Bartholdi's most well-known project is by far the Statue of Liberty, there are many other examples of his work, such as the Bartholdi Fountain in Washington, D.C. And even more surprisingly, the Statue of Liberty wasn't always intended to be given to America. In fact, it was originally intended to be given to Egypt, to be placed at the Suez Canal, as Bartholdi drew much of his creative inspiration from the architecture there, from structures such as the pyramids and the Sphinx. Hence, Bartholdi's model for the statue is not certain. Theories vary, from Lady Liberty's iconic face being based on an Arab woman when the statue was meant to be given to Egypt, to more popular theories that the statue was based on Bartholdi's mother, or perhaps even his wife. 
As Bartholdi began work on the statue back in France, he was kept thoroughly busy with the task of building the pedestal for the statue itself. You see, the pedestal alone took five years to finance and build, from 1881 to 1886, longer than the statue itself. However, the construction of Lady Liberty was also no easy task. It required a massive amount of funding from both France and the United States. It was agreed upon that France would be in charge of creating and assembling the statue, while the United States would be responsible for funding and building the pedestal. Both countries took a varied approach to financing this incredible project. France called on its people with a mixture of public fees, entertainment, and lottery, while the United States financed the pedestal with art exhibitions, theatrical events, auctions, and prize fights. In fact, it was one of these art and literary auctions that the famous Sonnet of the New Colossus was written by Emma Lazarus in 1883. Funding was still incredibly slow, however, due to the cost, there was also a fair bit of opposition to the statue from New York residents, an issue that was resolved on the PR level, and in a rather amusing way. Rumors were spread through New York that the statue would go to Boston or Philadelphia, two of New York's biggest rivals, and this lit the fire under the feet of hesitant New Yorkers, whom, whether they were in favor of the statue or against it, refused to allow this extravagant gift to go to either of those two cities. It was thanks to this competitiveness and Joseph Pulitzer's advertisement of the cause in New York World newspapers seen by thousands in 1885 that the financial movement truly gained traction. Their donations weren't thankless in the slightest. True to his word, Pulitzer printed every donor's name in the newspaper, causing a massive spike in donors. And by the time that the pedestal was fully funded, 120,000 people had made donations, totaling upwards of $100,000. Back in France, Alexander Gustave Eiffel, not long before creating the world-famous Eiffel Tower, was brought onto the project as an engineer to address certain structural issues identified by Bartholdi due to the sheer size of the statue alone. Originally, Bartholdi had envisioned the torch's flame to be a solid mass of copper wrapped in a thin cover of gold leaf. It was to be lit by a series of floodlights from the balcony, but this request was later overruled as it would run a severe risk of blinding passing by pilots. Bartholdi rectified this by cutting several portholes into the body of the torch's flame, into which light bulbs were placed. Anyhow, the statue was finished in 1884, though France's job was far from over. Next came the incredible task of transporting such a massive statue across the Atlantic Ocean to its permanent home on Bedloe's Island. The fully completed Statue of Liberty measured 151 feet and 1 inch in total, weighed in at 225 tons, and cost $400,000. It was incredibly large, so much so that it needed to be disassembled into 350 pieces and packed into 214 separate crates aboard French freighters. The cargo was so heavy that a ship nearly capsized during its transatlantic journey. All the same, the the statue arrived in the United States on June the 17th, 1885, but wasn't assembled until the pedestal was completed just under a year later in April of 1886. Surprisingly, however, this wasn't the first time that the torch had been in the United States. In fact, in 1876, about a decade prior, the torch was exhibited in Philadelphia and later in New York's Madison Square Park in order to raise funds to pay for the statue's pedestal. But on this trip, it was time for the torch to rise. On October the 28th, 1886, President Cleveland officially dedicated the Statue of Liberty in front of a massive crowd. The masterpiece was strategically placed to face the southeast, serving as a welcoming symbol and a beacon for the incoming ships entering New York Harbor. From the beginning, the statue was a tourist magnet, but back then, it was possible to go beyond the crown and into the torch. 
Although the public has been permanently denied entrance to the torch's balcony for over a century, it wasn't always this way. In fact, visitors were allowed to climb up the entirety of the statue, including the torch, until 1916. Yet, due to the narrowness of the statue's arm, only 12 people were able to make the climb up the torch at once. This area was so small that there was only room for a single ladder and no stairs. The visitor would exit onto a balcony through a small door underneath the flame, which would offer a breathtaking view of the New York skyline from an incredible 300 feet above ground level. There are conflicting opinions on who could actually visit the torch. Some claim that it was available for all. Others hailed it as a popular spot for the adventure tourist. And the New York Times reported that not just anyone was allowed up to the torch even in the early days, but that this was a privilege reserved only for incredibly special VIP guests. Given the infamy of the Statue of Liberty, some degree of urban legend is probably to be expected. We do know for certain, however, the definitive moment when the torch of the Statue of Liberty closed to visitors forever. When World War I was raging on in Europe, the United States had remained neutral until 1917, when the nearby Black Tom Island, which was housing munitions in masses, was sabotaged. The hostility came from Germany, a country that saw the dealing of munitions to Europe as a threat and took actions against the United States. On July the 30th, 1916, at approximately 2.08 a.m., a massive explosion at a munitions depot on the pier connecting Black Tom Island to New Jersey shook the harbor, killing four people and wounding hundreds. According to Jersey City University, Ellis Island had to be evacuated and the explosion reached so far out from the harbor that windows in Times Square were also blown out by the blast. NBC reports that the island's isolated location, as well as the decreased number of immigrants coming to Ellis Island after their home countries began countermeasures to stop citizens from leaving to escape the draft, were both responsible for the lower number of casualties. Anyhow, the attack was later confirmed to be carried out by a group of German agents, and the explosion also damaged the Statue of Liberty's torch and arm with flying shrapnel. And from there on out, the torch was closed to the public. It should also be noted here that the right arm's structure had also suffered wear and tear from years of people climbing up and down, having not been designed to support so much weight. Some guests even report to have felt it shaking from within, which must have been a terrifying sensation when 300 feet above ground level. In some ways, the torch is the most vulnerable part of the grand structure, requiring ongoing maintenance and ultimately a replacement. But that's not the statue's only weak point. In fact, maintenance over the years has been outrageous. According to statueofliberty.org, a mere six years after its dedication, the upper row of portals were replaced with an 18-inch belt of glass, an octagonal pyramid skylight with red, white, and yellow glasses were installed on the very top of the flame for lighting. This design remained until 1916, when it was changed once again, this time by the sculptor Guston Borglum, famous for his creation of Mount Rushmore. Borglum removed the copper in roughly 250 places on the crown, replicating it with an ambered colored cathedral glass. However, this turned out to be a fatal mistake as it left much of the torch exposed to the elements. Over time, rain and snow corroded the torch's vital framework, and in 1931, an entirely new lighting system would need to be installed. These large deviations from the original design of the torch left the original vision all but unrecognizable. Lost in a myriad of modifications that had been made over the better part of a century, Another large change that Lady Liberty underwent was a drastic change in color. When she first reached New York's shores, rather than the light shade of green you will most likely recognize today, she was a beautiful, rich red copper. It wasn't until 30 years later that the Statue of Liberty became a bluish green color that most people associate her with. This came about as the result of several different chemical reactions involving copper, sulfur, and oxygen, along with the varied pollution of man-made emissions that came from the city air. 
This natural oxidation then caused the statue to change from a shiny copper color to a deep dull brown and then finally a bluish green. Other far less desirable chemical changes have also taken place over the years. By 1980, corrosion and leaks from rain along with damage from the bombing had rendered the original torch damaged well beyond repair. It was removed from the statue on July the 4th, 1984 and replaced with a gold-plated replica that remained much more faithful to the original version and design. By the end of 1984, the old torch was finally moved to a small, limited capacity museum located in the pedestal of the statue, which workers had to dig a trench into in order to transport the massive torch inside. This museum was largely passed over by visitors to the Statue of Liberty. Business Insider reports that a mere 20% of all visitors who toured the statue made a visit to that museum to see the original flame. Bedloe's Island didn't become known as Liberty Island until 1956, when it was finally renamed. Around 10 years later, Ellis Island, which had since been closed as a federal immigration station for over a decade, was declared part of the Statue of Liberty National Monument. These monuments mostly remained open, but with a few exceptions such as the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. Liberty Island was closed down for 100 days after the attack, with the Statue of Liberty remaining closed for several years due to ongoing safety and security concerns following what is widely considered both one of America's largest tragedies and deadliest terrorist attacks. The Statue of Liberty did not reopen to the public until August 2004 though the crown would not reopen for another five years. In November of 2018, the original torch was removed from the base of the statue for the first time since being replaced by its replica in order to be moved across Liberty Island to its new permanent home in the new Statue of Liberty Museum. The museum site was located about 100 yards from the statue and Bloomberg reports in an interview with the president and CEO of the Statue of Liberty slash Ellis Island Foundation that taking down the 3,600 pound base and flame from the pedestal was quote very frightening as they had to use large freestanding scaffolding unlike when it was first placed inside the pedestal museum the torch had to be taken apart in two pieces just to get it out of the building so i bet you're wondering if you can visit the torch in modern day the answer is a very definitive no the only people who are allowed to access the 40-foot ladder up to the torch are the National Park Service staff members who routinely go up to maintain the balcony's floodlights and are affectionately referred to by some as the keepers of the flame. All the same, visiting the crown also offers a zest of adventure, if you can bear the long lines. And if you choose to visit, be wary of storms, as it is reported that the Statue of Liberty is struck by lightning around 600 times a year, thanks to her towering height and highly conductive material. At its core, the story of the Statue of Liberty, from past to present, is one of unity, considering what an unusual gesture it is for one country to create what might as well be another country's most iconic piece of patriotic symbolism, I'd suggest that this is a true example of meaningful artistry. So keep the story alive by subscribing to its history, sharing this video, and don't forget to check out our episode about New York's secret substations. This is Ryan Sokash, signing off.